In today's video, steady state versus high intensity cardio, what is better for your fat loss goals? Hey guys, what's going on? It's Paul Rebella from ProPhysique.com and I got my man Steve Bogrand here. Science with Steve with his big master's degree in exercise science. And we're gonna talk about a study that was designed around the idea of doing steady state cardio versus high intensity cardio. And I think they primarily looked at the hunger signaling outcomes. Correct. So they did look at some other outcomes as well. The main one that they were interested in was hunger signaling, overeating, and how different types of cardio uh, can affect the, you know, the individual's ability to stay on track or if they're going to be more predisposed to overeating and bringing in excess calories based on the cardio modality. Yeah, so the reason this is important to us is because as coaches and people who ourselves are practitioners of exercise, we want to put on muscle, we want to lose body fat, we want to get the best results for ourselves, but also for our clients, it's very applicable. And I think the industry as a whole, uh, the coaching industry, the physique competition industry has gone through these transitional phases where at first no one was doing high intensity cardio, then everyone was doing it sometimes two, three, four times a week oh, or yeah. more. And now personally, I've come back out of that realizing High intensity cardio might not be the best solution for, for, for people that are trying to get as muscular as possible and as lean as possible. So we're going to talk about this study and its implications and Stephen understands the design very well. Awesome. So this study had uh, three groups. You had a control group, you had a uh, steady state or endurance exercise group, and then you had a high intensity interval group or an interval training group. So they all had a little bit of a washout period. It was males only, so there were no females included in this study. Uh, and they all went through uh, each of the different interventions. So what they saw with this was essentially that the endurance exercise group ended up having some lower hunger signaling, some lower uh, calories ingested, and significantly better or improved results in terms of what the study outcomes were. Well, let's talk a little bit about explaining what the endurance group was actually doing and what the control group was actually doing, because I think well, that'll help people understand, because there is a lot of nuance to yeah. saying something like cardio. Mm -hmm. Everyone envisions something different, so I want to explain what was the control group doing for cardio? So the control group did nothing. They sat, they hung out, they read, they watched TV, Perfect. they did nothing. Perfect. So now you get to compare that to the group that was doing endurance cardio or what we would probably call steady state. Steady state cardio. All cardio, both modalities for steady state and interval were both done on a bike and they did measure the expired gases for calorie expenditure during those as well. So for the steady state, how long were they doing the sessions? 60 minutes on the cycle. 60 minutes. So if you compare that to what we're doing typically here, you know, incline walking, elliptical stairs, 60 minutes, that's a pretty long bout of exercise. Of course. It's definitely a good chunk of your day. Okay. Um, now, did they talk about like, you know, the intensity of that? 60 they did talk session? about the intensity and it was kept stable and steady based on their expired gases that they were measuring okay. every um, so often. So it was still under, of course, any kind of really crazy thresholds. Uh, but I would say it's probably more on that maybe light, moderate to moderate intensity. So do you think that they were able to hold a conversation while they were doing the cardio? Yes. So they should have been right around that ventilatory threshold, which the talk test, can you hold a conversation, yeah. is a very good indicator for. So the reason I use that is that's, that's something we discuss with our clients. If you're doing a cardio session where you cannot hold a conversation, the intensity might be too high for the specifics. And that's something that we can use because it's very hard if you're not in a lab yeah. to test kind of the ventilatory threshold that you're talking about here. But as someone who does cardio, you know when you start to breathe a little deeper, when you have to hold your conversations to speak, and you can also know when you can just freely talk while you're moving, like going for a walk outside. So probably a little bit more intense than that, but not so intense that they're breathing deep and they have to pause before they speak. Correct. Okay, so now let's talk about the high intensity cardio. And before we talk about this, what they did, understand that there is a big difference between doing intervals, guys, where you go at a steady pace and then you go a little bit faster and then you go at a steady pace. True high intensity cardio, I'm gonna let Steven explain it. So what they performed was a wind gate test and they had 30 minutes of total wind gate testing. So in a wind gate test, you are doing a short warm up, then you are doing all out intensity. Um, it is providing resistance on the bike based on your weight and kilograms and how much, you know, wattage is or power your. So I'm going to actually have Faith put a video of someone doing a Wingate sprint while we're talking here as B roll. <laughs> Just so you understand, like I've done these before and the feeling is impossible to replicate. They literally start you spinning your bike at full speed with no resistance. Then they drop a weight on, add resistance. 
a weight you probably couldn't have moved very effectively without having that full speed. And then you go as hard as you possibly can for 8, 10, 15 seconds, if you can make it 15 seconds. And I tell you, at least half the people when we were doing these tests were getting nauseous or vomiting. Yes. And it's funny because this uh, protocol, they actually mentioned in the study design that 11 out of 12 of the people who did the Wingate tests reported nauseousness and nausea. Three out of 12 of those people actually did get sick and vomit. Yeah. Um, the test is very intense. It is all out. You have a bunch of people around you screaming, encouraging you, come on, let's go, get through the last yeah. little bit of the test. So it's... It's very, very high intensity, probably much higher intensity than most people have ever done. Right, and so this became very in vogue maybe like seven, eight, 10 years ago where people were doing a lot of high intensity cardio because the benefits were touted that while you do less cardio, you get more benefit from it, okay, in a shorter amount of time, and there's something called the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, or EPOC, that was supposed to be so powerful that if you did this short little cardio session for the next 48 hours, you were burning body fat. Correct. But I think the science has shown that that effect is not as impactful. And right. this study actually showed that, right? Right. And so uh, they actually did uh, give the Wingate group extra calories added and kind of aired on the side of caution for that to account for EPOC. Um, and still, though, uh, the total calories that the interval or Wingate group burned was less than what the endurance group burned. Right. Uh, so they did obviously look at that calorie expenditure as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about hunger. How was hunger related between the control group, the endurance group, and the Wingate group? So everybody went through the same processes. They were all given a specific breakfast. That was the same throughout, and that kind of equated to their calorie needs based on some calculations and some fun stuff. Science. Uh, <laughs> and then afterwards, they were given access to a buffet. They were all kept completely individual. They didn't have anybody else that was seeing them, so there was no social cues. And then they just paid attention to how much each group was eating. They weighed what was left over, they weighed what was taken, they had all of the calorie values and they equated calories and what that meant for everybody um, in terms of actual calories consumed. And then of course they had questionnaires in terms of perceived hunger as well and some other things to help to uh, kind of get those values and numbers for them. All right, so what were the kind of the results between the three groups? So the results were actually pretty consistent throughout. Uh, the control group had a little bit higher of maybe some of the hunger hormones that they had tested, um, PYY and acylated ghrelin, um, which science uh, <laughs> it would be a lot to get into. Uh, but in general, both exercise groups did see a decrease in some of hunger signaling stuff. Uh, post-exercise. However, the endurance group saw a larger decrease and lower hunger, lower calories throughout the study, pretty much on all measures. You just said that the groups that exercised had less hunger than the group that sat still. Correct. I think that would be interesting for most people. Now, it's something that I experienced. Of course. But I think most people associate, wow, I'm so busy exercising, I'm going to be hungrier. <laughs> Yeah, so it just doesn't seem to happen that way. Um, now, whether that's the physiological uh, mechanisms that we don't quite understand yet, whether that's associated with ghrelin, whether that's associated with P PYY or some of the other hormones, um, it just seems to be that when we exercise, at the very least after exercise, hunger does tend to be uh, suppressed. Yeah, and PYY is a hormone produced by the distal gut that actually signals satiety. Correct. Um, and we noticed that people that eat more protein have a little more of this. And obviously, the people going through this study, uh, it was a difference between the, the steady state group and the, the high intensity group. So there's, there's multi factors when it comes to hunger. It's Correct. not just one hormone or one factor. Mm -hmm. So how does this relate to us as athletes? So I think for us as athletes, um, it is a pretty clear indicator that what we've been doing in our approach for the past few years has been a wise approach in terms of utilizing more steady state cardio whenever available. Um, granted, obviously there's time constraints to that, but that it seems to set our clients, our athletes and ourselves up for more success. Because if you can do something with less stressors, with less effort, you now increase your chances at success. You have yep. less barriers to that. So if we're doing a lot of hit cardio or extremely high intensity exercise stuff, and it's creating that those hunger signals are now coming up later on in the day after exercise, those kind of things, that may be less beneficial for us in terms of our overall success in terms of the diet. Yeah, and so for HIIT cardio, it definitely have, has its purpose, right? If yeah. you're involved in a sport or activity that requires short 
quick outbursts of speed, then definitely you want to train yourself for that. But for physique athletes, for most of us that are just interested in putting on as much muscle as possible and keeping a lean physique as lean as possible, yep. I don't know that HIIT cardio is beneficial because as someone who was doing as many as two or three HIIT sessions a week in my preps prior to 2018, what I found was extreme fatigue outside of the gym, which went away when I switched to steady state cardio. And I just found that my training sessions would be impacted, not only physically, because if you listen to what he described, you can imagine you're doing high intensity cardio basically to failure. That is very demanding on those large muscle groups of the leg. So your CNS, your fatigue, your recovery, while trying to train legs multiple times per week yes. is going to have an impact on that. But also the psychological stress. I remember getting worked up and thinking, oh man, all day I've got this hit cardio session. It would actually create stress. Whereas I have no stress when I know I'm just going to go for a walk on an incline or jump on a bike and, and ride it or do an elliptical. And uh, what a lot of other people don't recognize or uh, maybe don't realize as much is that extreme fatigue can also impact the rest of your day. So if you have such extreme fatigue from your workouts, cardio sessions, whatever it might be, and you're not taking the dog for a walk, not getting steps in, not having movement with you know how you talk and speak, those are all extra calories that would normally be burned. They're no longer being burned because yeah. of that fatigue. Yeah. So if you look at the overall calorie burning of 24 hours, although you did a 30 to 60 minute hit session and burned a ton of calories, because you were so fatigued the rest of the day and possibly the next day, you actually burned less calories through NEAT or non-exercise activity. Therefore, you burned less calories. Whereas those that are just doing a steady state cardio session are not getting as fatigued. They can continue to go about their normal day. I, I, personally, it energizes me when I do a low intensity steady state cardio session. Afterwards, I feel more energized mentally, physically, and ready to do more things. The only issue is time. So you have to find a way to create a schedule, create a modality that works for your routine. But I promise you guys, movement is going to be the catalyst for all beneficial responses to your physique, in my opinion. I think I would agree. All right. Well, thank you, Steve, for explaining the science. We are all now smarter. And hopefully we can go apply this to what we need. Check out Steve on Instagram and YouTube below.